people out there from whatever rad time you're watching at whatever rad place you're welcome to the rad show i'm ryan and i'm david and together we are rad, rad. so Ladies. boys and girls um you know one of the key activities that i've really enjoyed during this quarantine period and i'm sure ryan you have too is the lifelong skill of reading i mean <laughs> You know, over the weekends when I thought, mm, what kind of activity can I do? I'm stuck in the house. Ooh, I've got some books to read. Oh, laddie, I'm going to have a good time this weekend. So, you know, I've really indulged in reading and it's it's been quite a fantastic, it's been a fantastic hobby of mine during this quarantine period. What about for you, Ryan? Man, I don't want to sound like a, like a weirdo or anything, but I think that books have always been my best friends and, uh, you know, then they're just, they'll never leave your side, uh, I guess, because they don't have the choice. But, uh, but yeah, I've, I've always found that the best companion is, is a book because they're there for you anytime you want. And, and you know, well, anybody who, who goes to our school knows you'll never see me really walking around without a book in my hand. So, so yeah, it's uh, <laughs> definitely, as you said, a lifelong skill and, 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 and maybe even a friend. I mean, you know, every book has a different perspective of how we can look at life, honestly. And that's, and that's, that's key for me. You know, I don't see it, life as, you know, a singular panel to look through. No, 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 no. It's multi-paneled, you know, it's got several areas to look at it from different perspectives. And that's, that's the beauty of reading. And that's why, you know, today, Ryan and I thought it would be awesome to give you our top 10 books or top 10 authors that we think you guys at some, some point in your life should definitely take a look at. Plus, this was a really fun exercise because yesterday you, you proposed the exercise to me and, and I immediately fell in love with the idea. Um, you know, any, anytime you have to think about this type of thing, it's like, whoa, that's a lot of pressure, man. I've read so many books in my life, but to pick 10 of them was, was fun because it made, you think, it made me think about all the different books that I've read. And well, hopefully what I picked today is representative. I can't, I can't they were sure for sure that it's the best 10, but they're good books, man. Dude, I, I had I, I struggled with this because I'm like, oh, this guy really can cut the top 10. You know, it's like, uh, it's a little bit like fantasy football, you know, or fantasy, uh, fantasy sports that people play being like, oh, I really want this person to be on my team, but I can't have him right now. But I'm pretty yeah. sure if I were to do this tomorrow, I might have a different top 10. <laughs> and yeah, and picking 10 is really hard, man. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, exactly, exactly. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. You know. So, on that note, let us dive in into the top ten authors or books that Ryan and I enjoy. So, on that note, drum roll. Okay, here we go. As my top ten book, now I struggled with this immensely, but because my number one was something of uh you know knowledge and information i really went with a theologian uh paul tillich and you know there's some books that will just plant that seed in your head and that seed just has a way of growing and paul tillich is one of those for me i read him when um i was 18 in my last year of high school we everyone had to read him uh the dynamics of faith and it made me realize you know like the actual act of believing honestly and the and like how do we believe why do we believe with whom do we believe you know there were all these elements and you know there's there's few books that that i can say that i really dissected sentence by sentence but paul tillich is one of those books especially this one dynamics of faith like the title of that is like eh what but it's it's a book that you know you really need to dissect sentence by sentence to understand what he is relaying to us and i read that in my last uh, term in high school and i mean <laughs> i'll say a lot of people really hated the book but i fell in love with it because of the ideas present with it and um you know the first sentence i still remember it today and it's uh faith is the state of ultimate concern and he breaks down that sentence 
throughout the whole book. Faith, state, ultimate concern. He breaks down those four words like throughout the entire book. And I'm just like, how can you use one sentence and break it down to such a like grandeur throughout the entire book so for me dynamics of faith i i thought i just wanted to share it with people because you know this being a high school podcast this was the book i read in in 12th grade and it it definitely opened my mind honestly and planted that seed um in my head so i was very thankful for that when i finished high school that's that's a, yeah it sounds really interesting i i just the title itself is uh is provocative you know mm. Uh, interesting too because you said that you kind of based your 10 pick off of your number one pick and I think in some way I did something kind of similar because uh, my my number one is uh, is fiction and probably not even a surprise but but we'll wait and see um, but uh, I, I decided because of that that uh, number 10 I'd pick a book of, of nonfiction and Joan Didion I think is a, a, one of the best examples of a, of a nonfiction writer um, who just demonstrates that that skill in writing? Um, she's she kind of um, splits the line between journalism and, and literature, and um, and sometimes she takes these uh, longer approaches to sort of personal topics, but also with that journalistic uh, kind of approach. So so it's very analytic, but at the same time she brings in this personal stories. And like for example, this book that I chose, where I was from which was the first Joan Didion book I read. Uh, she talks about California because she's from California. And obviously I had a personal connection with that. Um, and just the interesting sort of animal that is California. And then um, she, she wrote many, many books and I've, I've read several of them. She was a really important um, writer in the late sixties with a lot of uh, rock bands. And so she, she interviewed um, The Doors and a lot of the other bands that were popular around California, Southern California and Northern California at the time. Um, she wrote a, a beautiful book called um, A Year of Magical Thinking about uh, the year where her, her husband died and her daughter um, became ill and then eventually also died. Um, so exploring death. She always kind of takes personal topics and then mm -hmm. um, takes that journalistic uh, uh, knife and kind of cuts them open and really explores things, but with beautiful use of language. So, And uh, there's a really cool um, documentary on Netflix about Joan Didion. So oh, really? I would highly recommend it. What's, what's it called? Yeah, I might, I might watch that later on today or this weekend. Joan, Joan Didion something, something, something. Okay, all <laughs> you right. Won't, you won't be... The name, is, the name is enough for me to research. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, enjoy. All right. So looking through the next book. Lucky number nine, my favorite number. And uh, luckily enough, it's also uh, one of my favorite books. Um, in fact, I wanted to, to show the copy of it. Uh, you'll see that it's, it's pretty similar to the ones, the one displayed on the, on the screen, actually. Uh, but I bought this book at uh, City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. And this is uh, the famous bookstore that was actually sued um, because of this book. This book was considered to be indecent uh, in the late 50s when it was published. And it was actually banned uh, in a lot of the United States. And Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, was, had to go for his famous obscenity trial for publishing it. But I believe, I believe if I remember the story correctly, he eventually won the trial and um, obviously now the book is is able to to uh, be published but the book is by Allen Ginsberg one of the more important poets of the beat movement and um, maybe I just read the first line because it's one of the uh, most famous lines in history in poetry I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness starving hysterical naked dragging <laughs> themselves through the streets <laughs> yeah oh, dude, i've heard that, that before <laughs> oh it, it you know often t i i actually heard it first in a rap song and then later <laughs> i realized that they had borrowed it from Alan Ginsberg. yes uh it's a pretty famous line that gets 
remixed yeah. and reused in different but um but how and the poem is long the poem is um well of this little tiny book it's uh 30 35 pages long it's a beautiful beautiful poem about uh about his view of America at the time, and obviously him being kind of an outsider, uh, kind of a person of, from the alternative culture and his group of people and what they were living uh, back in the 1950s. It's a really, really beautiful book and highly recommend it to, to everybody. Oh, fantastic. I, dude, I had heard that quote before when you, the moment you started saying it, I'm like, wait a second what song movie or other book have i heard this from i'm like okay so this is 1950 allen ginsburg the originator right okay all right the the, the man with the plan if you will right yeah <laughs> i would i would say so indeed all right fantastic what did you pick for number so nine? uh for number nine i went with timothy o'brien for well okay everyone really knows him m very much for the book that i've mentioned at the bottom the things they carried um, I think like quite a few high schools in the U.S., they make people read that. Um, he writes with such amazing style, honestly, and I love the style that he writes in. You know, he's, you know, there, he's one of those authors who's very descriptive in terms of what he uses, like, you know, in the things they carry. There's an entire five to seven pages, I think, if I remember right, of just telling us what the soldiers soldiers during vietnam were carrying and he makes such like precise detail and you know it kind of like the storyline of that book is really good but the one that i actually liked a lot more than the things they carried was northern lights um yeah it's not about you know northern lights at all no it's about actually and timothy o'brien he was a soldier during vietnam so many of his books that he writes is about that movement in the 60s that took place mm -hmm. and northern lights like I have a brother like me, but you know, he's, well, he's alternative, let's say. So there's, it's a story about, you know, two brothers and the differences of their journeys throughout um, the sixties during like one goes to the Vietnam war another's part of the hippie revolution. So you kind of see this like juxtaposition in terms of what's going on in the U S during the, during the sixties during Vietnam. And, I just really enjoyed it because I found it relatable in terms of, you know, that relationship of the two brothers and where one ends up and where the other ends up. So I really, I don't know, for me, I know the things they carried is more well known, but I much, well, it's not that I much preferred Northern Lights, it's that. My goodness, I must have said something on this podcast. All right. It's really cool. It's really cool because I'm hearing it in your in your audio first, and then outside. Oh snap! Well, okay, we know the direction of it now. Okay. Well. <laughs> oh my God! Don't smite me yet. I still have a few more books to get through. Yeah. All right. But uh, yeah, Northern Lights. You know, it's it's relatable to me just because of that relationship between the two brothers, and it's something that um I still today kind of when I think of and how my brother is doing I sometimes you know imagine the northern lights um um narratives that were being played out in that book cool, so, cool. all right awesome. hopefully we won't be smited down quite yet we still have eight yeah. more books all right yes please <laughs> uh-oh but my book might might truly bring down the wrath of god oh no <laughs> mm, oh yes it's very much <laughs> i think we spoke too soon here ryan <laughs> certain to be to be to be punished oh well we'll see what we can do go ahead all right so for me um one of i mean he is i i i mean i don't know i i in many ways i wouldn't put him number eight as an author i'd probably put him a lot higher because i'm a huge fan of paul oster like i've always just had a connection with him um and i've read his books like you know ever since um leviathan and since uh, which when i was yeah 17 18 which um came out in the 90s but when all right so yeah paul oster for me was someone that i always um well for one my whole family like we're all a huge fan of paul oster we have um you know his short stories of new york but he's always based his setting in new york um and for me <laughs> I mean, you know, you can pick up any Paul Oster. In fact, I'm reading right now. It's one of the books that I brought with me to Columbia, but I never read. 
uh, mm-hmm. four, three, two, one. It's his most recent book and it was up for, um, the man Booker prize. And what I find interesting about this one right now is it's dealing with a multiverse, if you will. Like, you know, imagine there's another Ryan out there in four different, and it's so complex, the style that he's, that he's writing this book in because each of his books are 1.1 to 1.4 chapter and then 2.1 to 2.4 all the way till 4.1 to 4.4. The whole numbers, one, two, three, and four, is essentially um, the timelines from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. But um, the point one, point two, point three, and point four are the various uh, different timelines in these different multiverses. You know, it kind of plays with this idea of what if um, the steps that you took when you were seven were different than the steps that you took when you were eight, you know? So it deals with this concept of like, um, you know, there was about each action that we take has a different kind of scenario that can be played out. So I kind of really like this book that I'm reading right now because of that. And it's pretty long and, a little bit complex following four narratives all at once, especially when the characters are being mentioned and it's the exact same people that are appearing and, and everything. So I, I enjoy it. But for me, the book that really got me into Paul Oster, the first one that I read was um, Brooklyn Follies. It starts out incredibly dark, but it has such a happy ending at the end. It starts out, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the first sentence of it. It starts out by saying, yep, yeah, I moved to Brooklyn for no specific reason, just to die quickly. <laughs> and then it and then it finishes with this man with like people in his life and and this like love. So you know it has like a climax. It, it just keeps on going and the climax never drops. You know. So I, yeah, I I really liked um, Brooklyn Follies. But if you guys are interested, I highly recommend reading Leviathan and Mister Vertigo before you read Brooklyn uh, Follies, because they're a little bit more entertaining reads, I would definitely say. Leviathan, um, a blend of a, of a criminal and a, fa- and a family man at the same time. Um, so absolutely, um, I'd recommend one of those two books before Brooklyn Follies or his most recent, 4321. Cool. You know, um, one of the things that you mentioned uh, yesterday was uh, the fact that a lot of my choices are kind of uh, classic. I think. Mm. And, and it's one of the things that, you know, I've, I've always been aware of my reading choices. And one of the things that, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I need to correct a little bit is that I am very classic and, and not too contemporary. And for instance, Paul Oster is a, an author that um, I know that like I need to read, but I haven't got into it. And um, one of my, one of my uh, really good professors uh, of literature here in Colombia, actually, is a, a really big Paul Oster fan, and um, and I think I might have read one of his short stories, but I, I think I read it in Spanish, and so I don't really remember what it was. It's it's, it's uh, I, I know the, I know the short story, and most like it's uh, New York City, a, a tale of three stories. It's I, I'm drawing a blank, but I know that the short story that you're referencing, it's a series of short stories that. Um, are, are in a book together. I know the one, yeah, my mom has it at home. I know the ones that you're talking about, yeah. It could be, there, there was a story that we read, I remember about a guy, a specific guy in New York, and he was a kind of like a character around New York City and around uh, like Greenwich Village, I think it was. I forget his name though, but he's a real person too. Um, I think that might've been, but I could be mistaken, I don't know. But Paul Oster, yeah, and I've noticed that actually, I think he's quite, kind of um popular in colombia anyway well i think he's popular kind of all over but because they have a lot of his books in uh panamericana both in spanish and english so i think uh i will have to no absolutely yeah with the times (laughs) i'll I'll lend you this one once i'm done with it actually yeah really cool yeah 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 deals with multiverses and you know me i love thinking about the cosmos i do too i was just reading this morning about uh quantum computing and and i started writing a poem about cubits so it sounds like like a book that's right up my alley well speaking of being classic i picked this classic uh from we're talking about nietzsche died in the year 1900 so 
uh, it's, it's old, but but still a, uh, uh, just such a powerful book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, <clears throat> this is a book where uh, I actually brought this book. This was, I think, maybe one of the only books that I brought originally with me from the United States to Colombia. And I, because I remember reading it for the third or fourth time, uh, uh, the first year that I was here. And I, every time I read this book, I love it more and more. Every time it moves something in my soul uh, more and more, I can um, very honestly and very sincerely and without any embarrassment say that um, every time I read this book, it, it, it makes me cry at certain points because it's just, I think Nietzsche, and, and one of the interesting things is that during the time that he was writing this book, he was, uh, he was at the end of his life. He was dying. And um, he was dying of, uh, of a very painful disease. And so he, his eyes were, were swelling and mm. he would suffer every single moment during the writing of this book. And yet the book is just a celebration of what it means to live. And so um, Thus Spoke Zarathustra is a, you know, it's, it's a classic to rebellious uh, uh, young, young people as well, because this is the book where he announces that uh, God is dead. Um, whatever you want to understand by that. But, but really, I think more than that, it's just about um, what, it, what a beautiful experience it is to be alive. And so uh, my number eight book is Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We're looking at book number seven right now. <laughs> I guess that's me. So, ooh, cool. You got the same, same version here. Uh, Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, speaking of multiple universes, well, not exactly, but speaking of uh, a different way to understand the universe, uh, this book is so, so much fun to read. Um, first of all, it's hilarious. It's like the funniest book about war that you I could probably ever read. Um, and it doesn't mean that he takes war lightly. Uh, he was, um, Kurt Vonnegut was actually in the German city of Dresden when it was bombed by the Americans and the British. Um, and the town, was, the, the town was completely destroyed and um, thousands and thousands of people died in that bombing. Um, actually, more people died in the firebombing of Dresden than in the nuclear attacks on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But um, he finds a way to, to take a comic uh, outlook on life and death and um it's it's so much fun plus he also finds a way to sort of um write science fiction but at the same time also make fun of science fiction for being kind of corny and kind of silly sometimes uh but at the same time also take science fiction quite seriously and it's a book about time travel and it's a book a little bit about everything and so um and it's so it's like 250 pages as well which is the funny thing like it, in such a short little book, he talks about so many different things. You will like literally laugh out loud several times. And, um, and it's, I read this book, I think I bought it a couple of months ago. And I think I literally read it in three days because I was just, I had read it before, but, but I read it in three days just because it's just, it's one of those books that you just can't stop reading. And you just want to find out what will happen to Billy Pilgrim as he travels through time. So awesome. I recommend. No, you, you've even talked about that book to me um, when I've had lunch with you before at school. And some of the things that you've talked about in that book, like, you know, time travel and everything, it, it's, it's something. And you even told me about, you know, like the representation of illusions in, in Slaughterhouse Five. And it's something that makes me be like, well, I mean, I mean even I've had some friends that have, uh, most friends that I've been to, like, their apartment or their house, I've always seen this book somewhere in their house or apartment. It's definitely something that um that interests me a lot yeah so for my number seven um you know I've, I've never told many people this but the way that i actually really got into reading um when i was like 12 13 was um, reading spy novels there's always a genre out there that i think will appeal to anybody and at my age when i was 12 13 I mean, I think there was still a Jason Bond, James Bond coming out in the movie theaters. And I remember one time somebody told me like, no, you should just read spy novels if that's what you think's really cool, you know? I was like, all right, cool. 
So, you know, the first spy novel that I actually ever read was Robert Ludlum, The Moscow Vector. Well, he didn't write it per se. He started it and it was finished by another author. Quite a few of Robert Ludlum's books he started, but they were never quite finished. I'm not sure what that's called in terms of um, someone starting a book and then finishing it. Is there a term for that? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I know that there is. I'm just drawing a blank at it. Um, but anyway, many of Robert Ludlum's books uh, were the ones that turned me on, but the one that um, really, really got me into um, spy novels was John Lecrae. Um, you know, funny enough, all three people, Tom Clancy, I mean, there's three main spy novelists, if you will. John Lecrae, Tom Clancy, Robert Ludlum. I've read a little bit of each, each of them. And John Lecrae, he's the one who does it for me, absolutely. And he's, he writes such good spy novels that John Lecrae isn't even his name. It's not even his name. It's not his real name. No, no, no. His real name is David Moore. But he's such a good spy novelist that nobody knows that. So the one that really got me um, turned on was uh, The Tailor of Panama. But so many of John Lecrae's books have been converted into movies, you know, like um, The Constant Garden. Um, uh, John Lecrae is uh, uh, The Night Manager, um, uh, uh, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. There's, so, there's a huge selection, but he was um, in the Secret Intelligence Service in the U.S., Tom Clancy and Robert Ludlum worked for the CIA in the U.S., both in the 60s. Um, so, you know, any of these authors, you can pick up one of their books, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you'd get pretty into it. Um, I'm sure people have heard of the Born Identity series or the Born series. Robert Ludlum wrote all of those books. Um, let me just say, the movie is nothing like the books, honestly. The books are, are much, but much better. I remember reading uh, the Born Legacy before... The Born Legacy even came out. I'm like, that's 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 not how it appears in the movie. Yeah, no. Um, and Tom Clancy, he's the other spy novelist. If uh, if you like kind of uh, reading about action in movies, you can definitely look at Tom Clancy. But in terms of more espionage, definitely look at John Le Carre or Robert Ludlum. Um, John Le Carre will still, in terms of spy novelist, he's still my number one, honestly, because. He writes the stories with such twists and endeavors that you never know who's coming around the corner, honestly. Um, but yeah, Robert Ludlum was my first spy novelist and the second was John Le Carre and John Le Carre from there turned it on for me uh, for spy novels, definitely. Um, but these are the three main ones that I at least wanted to share because, you know, I, I, some people like action movies. Me at 13, I was like, yeah, action movies are pretty cool. And then I started reading action, like, spy novels. And I'm like, dude, these are even better because I have no clue what's coming around the corner. So, yeah, yeah, definitely a huge fan of spy novels. And that's what got me into reading, actually, when I was younger. Nice. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I never got into spy novels. But, uh, but what I, think, I think what interested me was fantasy. And so I got no. into, like, The Lord of the Rings and, and Narnia and all of that stuff. Those, those types of things hooked me, you know? Yeah, everybody yeah. Everybody has the hook, right? Every, I think everybody, I think everybody's a potential. Yeah, I think everyone has like, you have to find that genre that hooks you in. And for me, it was spy novels. But, you know, naturally today, people were like, you know, magic all of a sudden seems to be like the main thing that pulls people in with Game of Thrones or the Harry Potter series. Or, uh, you know, magic seems to be the element that really throws people into a world of, like you said, fantasy, honestly. But I think everyone knows whether you say that you don't like reading, there is a genre out there that works for you, 100%. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, just a little side note, for example, my my, uh, my uncle, my uncle Tomas, uh, he's my eighth uncle on my dad's side of the family, and he was the youngest, and he hated reading uh -huh. until um, my grandmother came home one day and said, like, look, this is a book all about a man who chases women and he's like oh, give it to me and that's how he started reading honestly he was like oh my goodness really oh that's the genre i'm looking for so you know everyone's got their genre a hundred percent it's all just about you know finding it definitely i think i think this is that most people don't know that they write books about whatever it is that they like right yeah and so you know there's yeah exactly there's a book out there for everybody yeah and no. there's a book about just about everything in the world you just you just gotta find it
And once you get that genre going, you know, and then you start to read that genre more and more, that's when you kind of infuse yourself into reading and you say like, oh, there's other things I like to read now as well, you know, but the, there has to be that spark, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, moving on. Onwards. Okay, um, this is even, so that's me. Book number six. Now, Paul Betty, he's a fairly new author. I'm a huge fan of him. Um, I started reading him, funny enough, um, last January, actually. So a little over a year ago, but I read uh, The White Boy Shuffle and The Sellout um, in January and February of last year. And I absolutely loved his style of writing. Um, he's someone who did a master's in African American studies. He did a uh, master's in it. So he always writes around um, you know, I mean, he does depict stories, um, about, you know, not to the degree of like, you know, I am of a different race, but it's more of like, I'm trying to adapt into society there. It's, there's something about his writing that always has persuaded me to continue and continue reading. Um, actually the sellout, if I remember correctly, was up for the man Booker prize. I don't remember if it won or not, but it definitely was on the man Booker prize two or three years ago. And um, I, the book that, after I read that one first, I read The White Boy Shuffle and that one, that one did it for me, honestly, because it was, he throws so much humor into his books. And that's what I love. It's like the humor that he has in his books. Um, there's like two or three stories, like small little things that happen in the sellout that I'd love to tell. But uh, maybe you should read the book rather than have me tell you because they are, I, I had to put it down because I laughed so hard. Let me say that. And I've rarely laughed. Like, I remember my dad being in the kitchen. He's like, what? What TV show are you watching? I'm like, I'm not watching a TV show. It's a book that made me laugh this much. So, you know, there's, he, he has a fantastic humorous style of laughing that really draws me in, honestly. So I've, I, I do love Paul Betty's style of writing, definitely. Um, but the first one that he wrote was Slumberland, and I haven't read that one, but um, I'd like to maybe get my hands on, you know, there's always that element of an author's first book. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to see what his first book was and, and how it, you know, how it, how it manifested itself, if you will. Right, right. Huh. Yeah, I, I, love, I love when a book can make you laugh yeah. out loud like that. I think that is a... It's a rare characteristic, but you yeah. know, some people, some people have that ability. Well, after this podcast, I'll tell you the small story about what happened in the sellout because I, th I think you're gonna, you're, you're gonna find yourself on the floor as well. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, mine is uh, is not that funny, but um, still, uh, it's an author. Um, one of one of the other you know things um, about studying literature, I guess, in the U.S. is that we sometimes tend to focus a lot on, you know, Anglo American literature. And so stuff that's written in English. And I think, I think especially in the U S um, we don't pay enough attention to maybe, you know, other, other uh, languages, literatures, um, unfortunately. And so for some reason, I mean, this is, this is one of those authors that I had never heard of even until uh, I came here to Columbia and, um, and my wife actually introduced me to him through this book, uh, Invisible Cities. And then after that, I've gone on to read uh, several other of his books. And um, he's uh, only, you know, a novelist, but he's also like a, sorry, was um, a poet and um, a member even of this uh, fringe poetic movement in France called Ole Po. And he is, uh, I don't know, it's hard to, ex it's hard to describe, but um, Invisible Cities, for instance, is a, is this book about this dialogue between Marco Polo and uh, Kublai Khan. But I think one of the cool things about, about Italo Calvino is that, um, is that language, in a way, always seems to be sort of the protagonist of his books. And so in this book, it's interesting because you're reading it and you're, you know, supposedly these historical figures at one time did meet, but then but then eventually you start to realize like, well, they're actually not speaking the same language. And so Marco Polo is telling, um, telling Kublai Khan about his, his enormous empire. Uh, but then you start to realize like, how is he telling him this story? And through these little descriptions of these 
cities. Um, you start to realize sort of how language, I, I, anyway, I see it as a book about language and how language really constructs our realities. It's, it's a difficult book to describe. It's one that I, I think you just have to read. Um, we do have it in the library uh, at school. I may have been uh, an influencing factor in, in acquiring that book. Um, and I highly recommend it. I don't know. I've, I've had mixed, mixed results recommending Italo Calvino to people. Um, not everybody falls in love with, with his writing the way that I do, but um, I've, I've read some really amazing books to this guy. And so I would, uh, I would put him up there in my, my authors for sure. And, and I'm, can I ask you, is his book a translation? Because I, I, I have a few remarks to make later on about books that are translations. Yeah, I'm curious. Did, was it originally? Yeah. In? Hmm. That's the thing. It, it is, a, well, at least I read it in English. Um, Tal Calvino was actually born in Cuba, but, um, but his parents were Italian. And then I think he grew up later in, in Italy. Um, I'm pretty sure he wrote in Italian, I guess. Although, you know what? I don't know. Um, maybe he wrote in Spanish. I, I don't know. But, um, but the tra yeah, that's another thing that I've always felt about this book is like, wow, this translation is incredible. And um, yeah, I also have weird feelings about translations. But, um, but this one I would, uh, I would definitely put up there. Well, it, Anyway, maybe the original book is terrible. I don't know, because eh, I don't know how to read in Italian, but, but I can tell you the English translation of it is fantastic. One of the, one of the most beautiful books that I've read, and I've read it several times. Um, I, it's, it's one that I just, I can't stop reading. I, I repeat it again. What were you going to say about translation? I'm curious. Well, uh, join us next week as Ryan and I dive in and tell you what our top five books are. We look forward to having you. Take care, everyone.